Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, everybody. I'm Don. I'm an alcoholic. I want to thank my hostess, Arisa, for all the good care she's taking care of me and my wife, Eileen, picked us up at the airport, uh, constantly calling, checking in, what do you need, what do you need, what do you need, and... Uh, I'm not a guy you want to ask that too often of, because I, I have answers to that question, and, uh, and she's been terrific, and thank you so much, and uh, I'm just delighted to be here at Stateline. It's just a, a phenomenal experience. Uh, there's a lot of old friends here I'm seeing and uh, making new friends, and I want to thank the committee. Uh, I've worked on committees, uh, putting on roundups and conventions for uh, 20 of my 22 years, and, and I know what goes on behind the scenes, and i uh, I know that you get together and you have committee meetings and there's things to discuss and I know that you agree on everything and you, uh, you play like kittens and everything's fine. But uh, I appreciate all your hard work. I know that when something like this seemingly is running so perfectly, it it seems like there's not a lot of effort, like it's taking care of itself. And that's, that's the, really the indication of how much effort went in before the doors opened. I really know you put in your time here. So thank you so much for that. And uh, I'm here to, you know, talk to you today about Steps 4 and 5, which are exciting to me. And, uh, you know, Steps 4 and 5, as much as anything, they represent that Herculean effort, you know, to take an alcoholic on that long journey from his side of the street, you know, from your side of the street to his side of the street. You know, and it would have taken a team of elephants to get me off of your side of the street when I got here. i got to tell you, you know, I'm, I'm not just an alcoholic. I'm an alcoholic slash victim. You know, it's always somebody else's fault. You know, I'm a victim and I'm a pessimist, uh, which means the glass is half empty and it's your fault. I, I'm sure my first words when I came out of the shoot were, put me back, you know, just just not happy about anything. And, uh, you know, I don't know if I was born alcoholic. I believe it's a disease. I believe it's a progressive disease. I believe the progression, like any disease, is different in different individuals. I believe in me it was very quickly. And I don't know if I was born alcoholic, but I know this. I was born weird. I just, I had all that alcoholic stuff going on from the gate. You know, I'm, I'm selfish. I'm self-centered. I'm not much, but I'm all I think about. I'm the kind of self-centered alcoholic. I'll get you in a corner, trapped, with no escape, and talk incessantly about myself for half an hour straight. And then at some point I realize I'm doing that, and I say, you know what, that's entirely enough about me. What do you think of me? And this this over-concern about myself, this undying love affair I have with self, how do I fit in, am I getting my fair share, what do you think of me? Do they like me? Do they not like me? I didn't have to come to Alcoholics Anonymous to learn to do an 11-step review. Most of us have been doing that our, our whole lives at night. You know, as goofy little pre-alcoholics laying in bed at night reviewing our day. And when we're those goofy pre-alcoholics, the score never comes out right. We never look at our day and go, boy, that was a great day. You know, it's usually, why did I say that? I'm so stupid. Why do I do those things? And we're irritable. and We're restless and we're discontent. And we don't know what's wrong with us until we drink. And for me, alcohol, as much as anything, it transports me. It takes me to the land of I don't care. And I get to step out easy and my... Fears fall from me, and I feel terrific. And for lack of a better explanation, I really do begin to have a spiritual awakening when I drink alcohol early in my drinking career. And I love the effect produced by alcohol. You know, what is the effect? You know, a lot of people will tell you that don't understand alcoholism. They'll say, ah, you know, you you kid yourself, you're better looking than you really are. Maybe. Gives you courage to go across the room and ask that pretty girl to dance. Maybe. Maybe. Let's you think you can actually take that guy on in a fight that's going to mop the floor with you, definitely. But that's not the effect for this alcoholic. The effect for me, in a word, is relief. It's relief from what swirls around in my head in a sober state. I got these huge resentments growing up. I grew up in Hollywood, California. When I was about two years old, my dad got up. Off of the couch, said he was going out for a pack of smokes, and we never saw him again. First big resentment. The real treasure resentment. The one I was going to protect until I came to Alcoholics Anonymous. My excuse, my explanation, 
for a life poorly lived. It was my father. The way he deserted the family, went back to his home state of Washington, got remarried, had three other kids, and pretended like that whole thing with my mom and the three kids he had in L.A. never happened. Just more fuel on the fire. And I kept that resentment alive for so many years. It was so valuable to me because I could always comfort myself in my head that I never had anybody to show me how to do things. I never had anybody to share things with. I never had anybody to protect me. I didn't know the difference between right and wrong because I was never taught. You know, when a funny thing happens when you come to Alcoholics Anonymous, and what happened to me is I had I got a sponsor, and he took me kicking and screaming through the steps of Alcoholics Anonymous, and in particular the fourth and fifth step. And it was amazing to me the things that I conveniently forgot on my way to Alcoholics Anonymous. Now, the guy that arrived at Alcoholics Anonymous on September 16, 1991, doesn't resemble me at all. You know, I hadn't worked in a year. I had warrants for my arrest in two counties. I hadn't had a valid driver's license in 10 years. I had hair down my back, a full beard with food stuck in it, and I lost the ability to speak the King's English. I, commu- you know, communicated in a series of hand gestures, grunts, and clicks. How you doing? <laughs> nice to see you. And I'm dying from alcoholism. And as bad as the outside looked, it was nothing compared to what was going on on the inside. And I got lucky. I walked into the Simi Valley Alano Club. I don't remember my first night in Alcoholics Anonymous, but I remember my second. At my second meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous, a big guy named Lou I brought a little guy named Mark E. over to me. And he introduced Mark to me. And, you know, I think about that night in Alcoholics Anonymous, how I hit the jackpot right away. You know, it was a small meeting hall. We were in the foyer of the uh, Alano Club. The meeting, the meeting rooms were in the back. And these guys saw a new man standing there with his back against the wall, with his arms folded, wearing sunglasses at night, tough guy radar out, just daring you to come talk to me, filled with fear, terrified. Barely got 48 hours of sobriety under my belt. So hard to get my eyes off of my shoes. Feeling so lost. The low point of my existence, and two good members of Alcoholics Anonymous saw through the bluster of the terrified alcoholic man, and they made a short journey of maybe 35, 40 feet across that meeting hall to do what happens in Alcoholics Anonymous in good meetings every night all over the world. They extended themselves to the newcomer, and they made me feel welcome. And we hear things in Alcoholics Anonymous. We tell newcomers if they want to feel better, they got to go shake hands, and you got to go get in the room. And I think that's all true. But i got to tell you, on my second day of sobriety, if you're asking me to make that journey to Mark and Lou, that 35, 50-foot journey they made to me, you don't understand. I can't make it because it's not 35, 50 feet. It's a million miles. You don't understand. I'm at the low point of my existence. I, I, I'm embarrassed that I'm even breathing the same air as you. How can I walk across the room and talk to you? You don't know what I've done. You don't know where I've been. I'm terminally unique. I'm ashamed at 48 hours sober and what I've done with my life, how I've treated people. I've been drinking whiskey for years, trying to shove down those memories to the bottom of the ocean, you know, but the problem with that alcoholic truth is the minute the whiskey's gone, the minute I'm hung over and I'm not drinking, that stuff just starts to bubble up to the top and it starts choking me out. And at 48 hours, I can barely stand in my own skin. I'm reverberating in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. And those two men came over to me and they saved my life in no uncertain terms by doing the simple actions we talk about and seeing the good meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous all over the world. And Lou sat me down with Mark, and he got me half a cup of coffee. And he patted me on the back, and he said, Don, this is Mark. He'll be your sponsor. And he walked away. And they assigned me my first sponsor in Alcoholics Anonymous. And I know that's not done everywhere. I know that's it. You, you hear stuff in Alcoholics Anonymous, though. But in my case, it was probably a great idea they assigned me the first guy. Because <laughs> you go to meetings, you're here, get a sponsor, get a sponsor, get a sponsor. And my favorite... Find somebody that has what you want. Huh. I wonder what I want my second day in Alcoholics Anonymous. <laughs> oh, I don't know. Maybe a pharmaceutical rep with a spare Cadillac. That's a, that'd be a good start. Because I guarantee you I wouldn't have picked the weenie boy they assigned to me. and Because uh, he was not cool. He was bald head and wire rim glasses and slight of frame and soft talk and... Uh, you know, there's this stuff that flies around Alcoholics Anonymous that you're here also. You know, you hear people say, you know, I don't lay the God stuff on the new people too soon. You know, I don't, I don't want to scare them out of the room. I don't want to 
miss an opportunity to be a service by scaring them away with it. My sponsor did not get that memo. Because he was laying that God stuff on me day one, telling me about how much he loved God, what God had done for him, what God had done for her, what God had done for that guy, and what God was going to do for me. And he was on fire with Alcoholics Anonymous. Isn't this great, Don? We're the lucky ones. We're here. They're out there on the streets, and they're dying tonight, but we're in here, safe in Alcoholics Anonymous. Isn't this terrific? <laughs> Okie doke, you know. I just, just thought the boy was a little touched, and uh, he got me busy in Alcoholics Anonymous, you know, and he got me into the book immediately. You know, I was holed up at my sister's house. I had finished my drinking there, and, uh, you know, I was on thin ice. The reason I'd come to Alcoholics Anonymous is I'd stolen their car one more time. I disappeared for three, four days one more time, and they were going to throw me out of the house. And uh, I'm not too proud to beg, and I begged for another chance. I said, I got nowhere to go. You can't throw me out. You got to give me a little time. I'll go to AA and everything. And then I looked behind me to say, who said the last part? Because I was not thinking about Alcoholics Anonymous 24 hours before I got here because I knew it wouldn't work. I mean, I was 31 years old. My life was over. When I was 25 years old, I received the gift of self-knowledge. I knew the drink was killing me. I made the alcoholic declaration. I'm not, I'm not drinking, so don't try to tempt me. I knew I was going to quit drinking, and I went on a six-year odyssey of trying everything I could think of to put down the drink. And I'm the kind of guy I could put down the drink for a day, three days, 12 and three-quarter days. But at some point, you know, that not drinking every day, trying to be good, it just gets to be too much work, doesn't it? And I would reach for that relief, and I would drink again. So I end up in Alcoholics Anonymous absolutely convinced of a couple of things. I'm your typical newcomer. One, I don't have any resentments. And two, I only hurt myself. Now, if you don't have any resentments and the only person you ever hurt was yourself, that means you're Gandhi and you live in a cave. But that's very typical when you come to Alcoholics Anonymous. And what I love about the fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous, and I think this is the true role, okay, that the fellowship plays in the recovery process of Alcoholics Anonymous. Now, the recovery is contained in the book. Recovery occurs with a sponsor and a sponsee at a kitchen table reading the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, taking the air, taking the action, saying the prayers, heeding the warnings that are contained in the book. But where the fellowship plays a vital role in that action is when newcomers come to Alcoholics Anonymous like this guy, terminally unique, you start to give me permission to not feel so different. Because what happens is I go to open meetings and you share in an open, honest manner about your alcoholism. Not about your promotion at work. Not about your new relationship. Not about the cool car you got or the dog that you're training and the trouble you're having with them. All those things really are going to kill a guy like me in Alcoholics Anonymous. But every now and then I, I catch a pearl early in AA. A guy would come in and they'd call him the share and he'd say, Well, I got up this morning and my head was in the corner and it was doing push-ups. And I'd get excited because I knew what he was talking about. And he'd say, my head noticed that I was awake, and it said, oh, good, you're up. You're a loser. (laughs) And they hate you at that job. They've always hated you. And I told my head to shut up, and I got dressed, and I went to work to that job that I hate. You know, that job I hate where I want to kill my boss. My sponsor told me if I kill my boss, he won't sponsor me. So I can't kill my boss. And I made it through the day, and I just grinded it through, and I'm thinking about God, and I'm thinking about the meeting, and I thought, if I can just get to the meeting tonight, if I can just get to the meeting tonight, if I can just get to the meeting tonight, I'll be all right. And I got to the meeting tonight, and I got a cup of coffee, and I talked to my sponsor, and he gave me a spiritual solution, and i got to tell you, I'm feeling a lot better about things. And that's the guy that saved my life in Alcoholics Anonymous when I was new. Because he was talking about the disease, he was talking about the mental obsession, he was talking about sponsorship, and he was talking about how do you get through 24 hours without taking a drink? Without blowing your head off, how do you do that? It's an enormous long time. It only takes a moment for disaster. you got to be good all day. And when I'm new in Alcoholics Anonymous, I want to drink every second of every day. My nerves are hanging out on my fingertips. And I'm so grateful for the men and women in Alcoholics Anonymous that continue to go to meetings and share about the disease of alcoholics of alcoholism and talk about the solution and talk about the problem that are willing to relive the horrors of their past, because when I'm a new man in Alcoholics Anonymous, I can't identify with your recovery. It means nothing to me. 
When I knew in Alcoholics Anonymous, if you want to go on a dissertation of the 11th step and the deep significant, inf- you know, infantile uh, possibilities, you're going to kill me. I want to drink whiskey. How do I go home and not drink whiskey tonight? You invite me out to coffee. You sit me down. You spend time with me. You tell me your silly stories, which gives me permission to tell my silly stories. Everybody comes to Alcoholics Anonymous, and in a sober state, those horrible memories start to bubble up. And we we, we sit in meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous, and we don't think the old-timers are looking. We, We shoot glances over at the window shades, and we real quickly try to read the steps. And two steps in particular get the attention of the newcomer, and that's steps four and steps nine, or what I like to call the oh, hell no steps. But now i got a sponsor who believes in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. And he understood something. He didn't use this language, but I'll use this language today. When you're new in Alcoholics Anonymous, right, you have something that's absolutely precious. The old-timers don't have it. They used to have it. They don't have it anymore. But it's incredibly precious. No newcomer recognizes this gift is precious. Because it makes you feel so uncomfortable. It feels so terrible. How could something that hurts so bad be so valuable? And that gift is desperation. And you sit there new in Alcoholics Anonymous, desperate. For the first time in a long time, you've arrived at a place, you're staying in one place, and you're out of ideas. Alcoholics Anonymous can only work when the alcoholic is out of ideas. If we've got one more card to play, one more, one more plan B. They don't work, but one more plan B, we're probably going to do it. But when we're new in Alcoholics Anonymous, feeling terrible with that desperation cloaked over us, we finally have a fighting chance. Because we, that desperation that feels so terrible when we're new actually turns out to be the propellant that takes us through the steps. It's the fuel that pushes us through the steps. Which is so important when we get our new friends here that we get them through the steps as quickly and effectively as possible. And that's what they tried to do with me. Because like any propellant, you don't know how much you got. How much you got? 30 days? 60 days? 90 days? 6 months? At some point, you're going to run out of the propellant, and everybody knows what that feels like to be in Alcoholics Anonymous, and you're going to do everything, and I'm willing to go to any length for victory over alcohol, and one day you just, maybe tomorrow. You know, I know I'm in pain, but maybe tomorrow, because you know what? I'm back in the big bed. I got a job now. I'm eating on a regular basis. It's very funny how physical sobriety will masquerade as real recovery and give the sufferer from alcoholism the false impression that he's actually doing better than he is. They drag us in on meat hooks, and two weeks later we're complaining about the coffee. The recovery of the ego, the recovery of the ego in Alcoholics Anonymous, in the alcoholic is far more quick, far faster than anything that the steps will do for us. The battle is with that ego telling us that we don't have to do the work here. So I'm in Alcoholics Anonymous with a sponsor that absolutely insists I do this stuff. And I get through the first three steps very quickly. And they're very simple for me, you know. I had a little misunderstanding with the first step, but I got through it. The powerlessness, I've been trying to stop drinking on my own, and I've been drinking against my will for six years. I understand that I'm going to drink again. I always drink again. I told my sponsor, to be honest with you, I'm probably going to drink again. I don't want to drink again, but I always drink again. I know that's not appropriate, but I was trying to be honest with the guy. He encouraged me to tell him how I felt about drinking. I said, I want to drink right now. I got no problem with you. I got no problem with your bright, shiny friends. They're so thrilled and telling me everything's going to be okay. But I just can't shake the feeling. I want to drink all the time. So I was, I knew I was going to drink an alcoholic. It's not, it was just a matter of time. Just be, this is no different. You know. I don't have the experience of slipping for five, six years in Alcoholics Anonymous till it's it's stuck, but I've never judged anybody that slips here. I slipped for six years. I just didn't do it under the bright lights of AA. You know, I got up every day and said, I'm not drinking today, and I drank every day, or maybe I'd make it a week, but I'd drink after a week, or maybe a month, but I'd drink after a month. And now I'm in Alcoholics Anonymous, and people drink sometimes. I try not to judge them. I did that for six years. I just didn't do it with you, with all you watching and judging me. It was a lot easier. (laughs) So I got no problem with the first half of the first step. I got a problem with the second half that says my life is unmanageable. And the problem isn't that I don't agree my life is unmanageable, but I believe the unmanageability of my life 
is really about all the societal aspects, the $80,000 I owe the IRS, the warrants for my arrest, and all this. And, and how can that be the unmanageability when there's a guy sitting next to me who's new, and he's got a nice house and a nice wife and two kids and a business that's doing okay, and he's drinking himself to death just like I am? And I had to come to understand that that unmanageability has nothing to do with the outside stuff. It really has to do with this. This is the unmanageability for me. When I drink, I can't drink anymore. Because when I drink, I'm afraid of the actions that I take. So I can't take drinking no more. And when I'm sober, I go plain crazy. Now, if you can't drink anymore because you're afraid of what happens when you drink, and you hate the way you feel when you're sober, let me tell you what, that's pretty damn unmanageable. (laughs) And I understand that that's the unmanageability today. And I had to go through that second step. And I was open-minded. Why not? I don't believe in God. That's no real opposition to that. So I didn't believe in God. What's the big deal? You know? My sponsor asked me the cute second step question. He paraphrased it. He said, Don, do you think by some quirk of the universe, some oversight of your keen intellect, you've missed the possible existence of a power greater than yourself? Well, maybe. Great. You're on the road to spirituality. (laughs) You know, just get out Bill's story. And Bill figured it out. You know, it was only a matter of being willing to believe in a power greater than myself. That was all that was required of me to make my beginning. So now i got the second step under my belt. And I take the third step on my knees with my sponsor because I'm ready. I've done the work in the first two steps. I've been going to 14 meetings a week. I'm at about two and a half months of sobriety at this point. I'm ready to turn my will and life over to the care of God, my thoughts and actions to God, only as I understand Him because I'm convinced I'm going to drink again. And it's the only shot i got, so I'm desperate. I turn my will and life over the care of God simply as I understand Him. And I say that third step prayer, and I mean it with everything I have. And I have the experience that the book says some of us have. I have a profound spiritual reaction to the third step. It was so profound, so beautiful, so deep, I was quite sure I would never drink again. So why in the world would you write an inventory? And I know the book says that this step will have little lasting effect unless followed at once by a strenuous effort to rid ourselves of the things that have been blocking us from him. But I don't think you had the kind of spiritual experience I had. My sponsor lines me out on the fourth step, and I start writing the opposite of what he lined me out with. My sponsor was a big book guy. He opened the book. He goes to the diagram. And right before the diagram in the big book, there's a little sentence that says, we were usually as definite as this example. And he goes, what do you think that means? I go, I have no idea. He goes, it means you don't have to write any more than this. This isn't a novel. It's never going to be published, hopefully. (laughs) You're going to write in columns. And he lined me out on how to do a four-step. And the problem was I didn't believe that I was really in as much trouble as I was. I didn't believe you could go from feeling that wonderful in Alcoholics Anonymous, that in love with Alcoholics Anonymous, at two and a half months sober, having just taken the third step, I didn't believe what was going to happen to me was about to happen. And what happened to me is I went plain crazy from untreated alcoholism in about 30 short days. And in 30 short days, I went from thinking my sponsor was the greatest guy in the world to the biggest buffoon in the world. And the color started to, you know, just leak out of the picture in Alcoholics Anonymous. And the light started to get dim. And I started to have a problem with what people were sharing in meetings. I started taking people's inventory in the meetings. And I started getting crazy in Alcoholics Anonymous. And I had gone back to work, and my sponsor, who was running my life, you know, this guy was so grateful would take on my case. Now he's his dictator. And he's crushing my joy, and he's crushing my spirit. And I wanted to go back in the aerospace industry, and he made me get a job in construction because it was humbling. And I'd love to tell you I was good at that job in construction, but I didn't. I sucked. I had a nickname on the job site, The Bleeder. (laughs) So two and a half months, I get up in the morning at 4.30 in the morning, and I walk an hour to where I get picked up to go bleed on a job site all day. And then I go to two meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous at night, and I'm starting to go crazy from untreated alcoholism. And I'm talking to my sponsor about how the terror is back and how I'm not sleeping at night and how I don't know what's wrong. And he says, the problem is you're not writing your inventory. And I said, that's not it. He goes, it's absolutely it. He goes, your problem with not writing your inventory, Don, is you're never here. When I talk to you, you're never in the moment. You're always in the past and remorse or in the future and worry. Past and remorse, future and worry. But you're never right here with me right now. Let me ask you something, Don. Right now, stand in the clubhouse. You okay? 
And I said, yeah, I'm fine. But, you know, tomorrow, he goes, you just left the moment. I don't know what he's talking about, the moment, the moment. I got a head like a beehive. What's the moment? And he explained to me the necessity of the sober alcoholic living his life in the moment because it's the only place that we can meet God. I can't meet him yesterday. I can't meet him tomorrow. I can only meet him in the here and the now and in the moment. And I think that he's wrong. And I think that Alcoholics Anonymous doesn't work. And I decide to quit Alcoholics Anonymous. And I'm going to leave AA and I wake up on a Friday morning, which were the worst because I'm just sleepless. And I'm going to, I'm going to go to AA that night and resign. If I have to sign something, I'll sign something. <laughs> and I'm thinking how sad it is that Alcoholics Anonymous didn't work for a guy named Don. And I, I'm walking down the hill from my sister's house at 4.30 in the morning and it's dark and it's black out. You know, it's dark, quiet and black everywhere in the world at 4.30 in the morning. And uh, I'm sad because I'm leaving AA and it didn't work. And then I saw him. A couple of big dogs, Rottweilers, you know, and they had gotten out from the neighbor's house. And they're like five houses down. They're doing exactly what 90-pound Rottweilers do at 4.30 in the morning when they escape from a neighbor's house. They're playing. They're jumping over hedges and chasing each other. They're rolling on the grass on their backs. And I'm watching these beautiful dogs, and I'm just mesmerized by them, thinking how lovely they are. And it kind of lifted my spirits. Just their joy transferred to me, and I felt better. And then they saw me. And they looked at each other, and they looked at me, and they looked at each other, and they charged me. And I started screaming like a six-year-old girl. (laughs) And I ran down the hill fighting off these dogs. They had a ball with me, just knowing they were going to kill me. And it just went off like a quarter mile down the hill backwards. And little pal lunch meat and my framing bags, fending them off like a scared alcoholic matador. And uh, I get to the bottom of the hill, and the dogs run off, and I'm... (laughs) <laughs> you know, and, uh, and now I'm not leaving AA. <laughs> At least not until I tell my sponsor my latest tale of woe, because you can't miss an opportunity like this. And uh, So I go into the meeting hall that night, I grab my sponsor, and I tell him a five-minute story in 30 seconds like a newcomer does. And they were huge, they tried to kill me, they had teeth like this, and I ran, and I fought them off, and... And he listens to the whole thing patiently, and I get to the end, and he goes, Well, I bet you're in the moment. (laughs) And he told me that he loved me, and he said that he knew God loved me very much, and he said, I hope that God doesn't have to send any more Rottweilers after you to prove it. And he suggested that I write my inventory. And I agreed. And I wrote that inventory. And the funny thing about writing the inventory, particularly the resentment part of it, you know, I've been writing those first three columns my whole life. I just didn't know it. It kind of wrote itself. You know, who am I resentful at? What was the cause? What did those SOBs do to me that I didn't deserve because I'm basically a wonderful guy? You get to that third column. How does it affect me? Well, how do you think it affects me? How would it affect you? You know, and you use the language from the book and you get all that stuff done. And that's easy. Easy peasy, and we do that with a fear list, and we do that with the sexual inventory. You know, but the problem is, the stuff that was keeping me up at night, and the problem I was going to have, right, doing a fearless and searching moral inventory, was that I had, in the third step it says that we're driven by a hundred forms of fear, self-seeking, self-delusion, and self-pity. I want to talk about self-delusion for a moment. A delusion, right, is a false psychotic belief. That doesn't sound attractive. A self-delusion is a false psychotic belief about yourself. And that means there's something that you think is absolutely true about you that ain't. And that kills more alcoholics than anything else. I'll give you an example. When I got sober, my grand sponsor used to, I would tell him about how whiskey made me do this and whiskey made me do that. He'd say, listen, man, whiskey didn't make you what you were. It exposed you for what you were. And I didn't believe that. I thought I was incapable of doing those type of things unless I was drinking. Of course, when I was out of money and I was two and a half months sober and leaving the house at 4.30 in the morning, and I knew my sister, why did she leave her purse right in the washing machine where I had to walk past it? And I'll just take a peek, and she's got all this cash, and I'm in AA now, and I'm sober, and I'm supposed to be, and I would take a $20 bill. <laughs> and I would just feel terrible, you know, and I, but I'd spend it. And then on payday, I'd have to sneak back in her purse and slide the $20 back in there. 
And I just felt horrible about this. It went on four or five times I did this over the months until finally one day I just couldn't do it anymore. Maybe I'd heard the right thing in a meeting. Maybe I'd had prayed enough on my knees. I don't know, but one day I just couldn't do it. But I remember when I had to make amends for that. How embarrassing. It's one thing for all the rotten crap you did when you're drinking. I did this stone cold sober. I told my sister I'd been stealing from her purse early in sobriety. And she said, oh, thank God. I thought I was losing my mind. I go in my purse, I knew I had $55, I got $35. Then I go in my purse, I know I got $45, I got $65. I thought I was good. I'm so grateful you told me. It's trying to be a service. The very first thing Bill does in the big book when we talk about our resentment list, we talk about the inventory process in general, is he makes an analogy, and Bill did that. All good teachers use analogies, and Bill used the commercial inventory or the business inventory, the fact-finding, fact-facing proposition. He says that if you're going to be successful in business, if the owner's going to be successful, you can't fool yourself about values. One of the reasons you take inventory is to discover, which means you don't know it yet, discover the truth. Just the truth about the stock and trade. Another object is to get rid of unsaleable or damaged goods promptly and without regret. No big deal. We can't sell it. Let's get rid of it. It's damaged. We don't need it. Well, then he goes on to say, we did exactly, not as similar, not kind of like, we did exactly the same thing with our lives. Imagine if you were able to roll out a pantry-like thing and it was your soul. And you were able to look in there at your soul. And just record what's really there, without the justification and the rationalization. I mean, if you came to my house right now, I mean, i got a roll-out pantry, and if I gave a newcomer a piece of paper and a pencil, and I said, just list what's there, he'd go, okay, two cans of corn, it's got a bag of pinto beans, you know. If he'd go along, what he wouldn't do is this, oh, two cans of corn. <laughs> oh, God, there's pinto beans. Oh, I don't even remember when the pinto beans got there, you know. And there wouldn't be all this emotion about it, you know? And here's where the fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous does a disservice to the recovery process of Alcoholics Anonymous. We love to make things bigger than they really are, don't we? We're going to make it seem much harder after we've done it because we love to get... Look, when things go right, we want all the credit. When they go wrong, we deflect. That's who we are. That's our default setting. So we sit in meetings and we scare the hell out of our new friends. And I'm here to tell you, there's nothing in the inventory process to be afraid of. Only good has come out of inventory. So my sponsor encouraged me, just write down what's there without the emotion. Don't worry about it. And I wrote down what was there, and I wrote down all those things I had done, what my part really was in the way I'd lived my life. And I got all those resentments down on paper. And a pattern started to emerge, you know, so sure I didn't have any part in any of this. So sure that I, after what they did to me, so sure I was justified. But I followed the directions. I disregarded entirely their part. Although my part might have been small, I tried to disregard the other person entirely and get down to where I was to blame. The inventory was mine, not the other man. And I believed what the book had said about resentment. Why do I have to do an inventory? Best reason first. If I don't do it, I might drink. But why do I do the resentment? Resentment's the number one offender. It kills more alcoholics than anything else. That's what my book tells me. Well, how does it do that? It says it cuts me off from God. It cuts me off from the sunlight of the Spirit. It says when I harbor such feelings, these feelings of resentment, these feelings of I can't stand you, you didn't treat me right, life isn't fair, I am cut off from God. And for the alcoholic whose very survival is based on the maintenance and growth of a spiritual experience, these things are fatal. So when I'm in that state of anger, when I'm in that state of resentment, when I'm in that state of victimization where it's your fault and I can explain to you why, or even worse, the justifiable resentment or the one I like to call the one I can go into court with and win, those are even more dangerous. Because those are the ones I can talk to to my friends and my buddies, not my sponsor, but my friends and my buddies, and they'll go, you're right, I'd be pissed too. And you go, oh, good. And if you don't believe me, the next time you're really, really angry, and I'm not talking about perturbed or annoyed or somebody cuts you off in traffic. I'm talking about where that guy you work with, 
walks by and smiles and goes, Morning, Don, and you know what he means. <laughs> right then after that, try to pray. You will not be able to do it. I cannot have a conscious contact with God. Two opposites can't exist in the same space. I can't have love and hate in the same space at the same time. It just doesn't work. So I believe in that. I believe I'm going to be cut off from God. I believe that I'm going to drink again if I don't get rid of this stuff, and I don't know how to do it. But I go through the process, and I write everything down, and I write down my part in it, and I get to the fear part. And I'm ready for the fear part because I got that big secret, you know. I came in Alcoholics Anonymous, and I was quick to tell you the tough guy stuff I did, and the fights in the bars, and the crash cars, and the trips to jail, and all that. You know, there's an ego-based tough guy part of me that's kind of proud of that stuff. You know, I'll act like I'm remorseful. But, you know, I had all this wrong information about what a, a real man was. You know what I mean? That a lot of that stuff I wasn't as ashamed as I, as I came off. You know, the stuff I was really ashamed of and embarrassed about, my big secret is life has always felt too big for me. I know I look like a man, and I can do it for the short haul, and I can get the job. I can't keep the job. You know, I can show up in a relationship. I can get the girl, and I can get her to fall in love with me. You go out with a guy like me six weeks after you're dating me. You call up your mom. You say, Mom, I'm so in love. I found him. He's everything I've ever wanted. And six months later, you call your mom, and you go, Help me! And that's who I am. And I have all these fears, and I don't know what to do with them. So I get my fears down on paper. And you got to understand, I'm the damaged, delusional, paranoid, perception, problem-having alcoholic trying to take a searching and fearless moral inventory with some degree of accuracy. The reality is, my first inventory, I'm not going to be very accurate. Because I'm the one writing it. And if you drank the way I drank, I'm not quite sure what happened. And I'm not sure if some of the things that I remember actually did happen. But I'm writing it to the best of my ability. And I'm writing down that fear. St- and I'll tell you, the first time I went through the, the fear portion of writing the fourth step, probably the most powerful thing in there for me isn't getting, and it's so important to get our fears down, analyze why we have them. And then the book, you know, answers the question before we have a chance. Isn't it because self-reliance failed us? Or when we learn to live on a different basis, we're on the basis of trusting God. We trust infinite God rather than our finite selves. And that's wonderful, but I love the fear prayer. And I tell you, I use it today in my life. I use it almost on a daily basis. It's such a short, sweet little prayer. And I think sometimes the prayers that are embedded in the inventory process get lost in our day-to-day living because we're not doing an inventory at that moment. Or I already did a fourth and fifth step and I'm living in 10, 11, and 12. But I'm telling you, that fear prayer is so simple. Admit my fears to God. I ask Him to remove my fear. I ask Him to direct my thinking to what He would have me be. And then the sweetest promise, at once, once, immediately, I commence to outgrow fear. Commence means begin. It doesn't mean the fear is gone. It means I can feel it lifting. Maybe I can get off the couch. Maybe I can go to that appointment I'm afraid of. Maybe I can show up. Maybe I can register for school. Maybe I can ask that girl out. Maybe I can start to live the kind of life I want to live, not because the fear is removed, but it commences to be removed. It starts to be removed. But i got to tell you, there's only two things in my experience that kill fear for a guy like that. One is whiskey. Whiskey is a fear killer. It works tremendously well. Problem is, it's an equal opportunity killer. It kills everything. But it does kill fear. The other thing that kills fear is action. It's the only thing I've ever found. But the problem with action, if all I had to do was take action, well, just do the next right thing. And we say that in AA. Just do the next right thing. doesn't matter what you think. doesn't matter what you feel. Do the next right thing. Well, I believe in that. But why we're doing the next right thing, you got to remember, for this alcoholic, I don't have this strength. And I don't have the power. We talk about God commencing to do for us things that we couldn't do for ourselves. I have to go to God and ask Him to remove my fear and direct my thinking so I can even begin to take on these things. We talk about the resentment prayer, and uh, Jim read the resentment prayer, and I, and I love that prayer where we talk about... Yeah, this is a tangent when I go on. It's really clear in that prayer that what I'm trying to do is develop something that I haven't had before, which is really just compassion. Somewhere in my inventory process, when I'm writing my fourth and fifth column, or some people just write the fourth, and some people break it into four and five, I don't really care how you do it, as long as you get your part down in there. But 
I start to have an experience with something new, which is called compassion, because I start to see my behavior in my life, and I start to understand that, you know what? Everything that I'm condemning you for, I've been guilty of myself. And I start to go a little bit easier on you because I want people to go a little bit easier on me. You see, for most alcoholics, there's two types of wrongs, right? There's the wrongs that I do others. And when I do you wrong, and it takes me a long time in Alcoholics Anonymous and writing inventory just to get to the place where I begin to acknowledge that I sometimes do other people wrong. And when I get to that place where now I'm willing to admit that, when I do you wrong and I feel terrible, there's some things that I want from you. What do I want? I want a little understanding. I want a little compassion. I want a little forgiveness. But you know, when you do me wrong, the list is entirely different. What do I want when you do me wrong? Well, I'd like some vengeance. I'd like a little retribution. I'd like some groveling on your part. That would be nice. And through the inventory I process, I begin to discover there's not two different types of wrongs. It's all wrong. Wrong is wrong and right is right. And I begin to develop some compassion in that. And there's something that's crept into Alcoholics Anonymous. I don't know if it happens where you go to meetings. We, we hear about it a lot where I go to meetings. And, and that's that it, it's the one-stop shop process for handling your resentment. And instead of writing a four-column inventory when you have a resentment, what people do is they pray for the person that they're resentful against. And I hear this shared in meetings all the time. So, you know, I have this resentment against this girl I work with, and she's just, you know, she's a B-I-T-C-H. And uh... <laughs> But I'm praying for her, bless her heart, she's so sick. She's so sick. And, uh... and I just have to work my spiritual program because they're sick out there. And, uh... You know, there's nothing worse than an alcoholic and Alcoholics Anonymous screwing themselves out of the biggest gift we're ever going to get, which is the truth. If we're going to survive, we have to know the truth. We have to know the truth about the stock and trade. What's the truth? The truth is our lives. See, the problem with I, I've never prayed. First of all, I've never prayed for anybody I've had a resentment for in Alcoholics Anonymous. My sponsors have always told me, don't do that. They said, you are too ego-based. And this is why. I'm grandiose. I can't imagine praying for somebody I have a resentment against and not doing it from a position of superiority. And the other thing is, if all I have to do when I have a resentment against you, if I have a resentment against my wife and I go, oh, the poor girl, she's just sick, you know. And now I'm just going to pray for her. Well, you know, I'm going to screw myself out of ever doing the part where I get to figure out what's my part in it. Which means, like the book says, to conclude that others was wrong was usually as far as any of us got. The outcome was people continued to hurt us, so we were sore. We were burned up. So when I pray for somebody because they're so sick and I come from that spiritual place of superiority, it's just going to keep happening because I'm never going to find the only information that's ever going to change that, which is my part in it. I've got to find out how I set the ball rolling. I've got to find out what my part in it is. What role do I play in it? What do I need to change about myself, my reaction, or my attitude? And I can't do that if I'm praying for you, because when I pray for you, I don't need to change anything. Because you're just sick, bless your heart. (laughs) I write my sexual inventory. And uh, I'm looking for a pattern there. A lot of us get hung up and how many, and how often, and how we did it, and with who, and, you know, what I'm trying to look for is how my selfishness is showing up. You know, in all three phases of my inventory process, right, what I'm looking for, what my book tells me, is I have to arrive at a state, and the state that I'm in is I'm convinced that self is what had defeated me, that I am the source of the problem, that I am it. So because I understand that I'm the problem, and I'm I'm really the source of my misery in my life, I'm going to consider the common manifestations of how my self-will shows up in my life and hurts me and everybody around me. So I'm going to look at these resentments, fears, and my behavior in relationships and sexual relationships, right? Because those are the classic areas that shows up. And I get to that sexual relationship, and I see the pattern almost immediately. I never did anything for anybody I was in a relationship without keeping a ledger. Everything I did, it was because I wanted something in return. So even when I look like I'm kind, even when I look like I'm loving, I want something at the end of that for myself. So what I've been calling love for all these years isn't love. What that's called is bartering. That's called a business proposition. 
So I don't know anything about having a true partnership with another human being. I don't know what, how to love you just for the sake of loving you. And I get all this down on paper. And the book promises me, if I've done this accurately, when I get to the end of writing a good four-step, I probably digested some large chunks of truth about myself. And I really feel at this point that I really understand myself much better, that I've really found my part in things, that based with this new self-knowledge, this new information, it's probably impossible for me to go out into the world and repeat any of this behavior. But luckily for me, why I'm writing my inventory, I'm repeating the behavior simultaneously. I'm thinking, I've got to go in a cave for a week just so I can finish it because I keep having to add more. I'm trying not to talk to anybody. <laughs> and our book is very clear about why we do a fifth step. Why we have to admit to God, to ourselves, and to another human being the exact nature of our wrongs. The book says that most of us find a solitary self-appraisal insufficient. In my case, the reason the solitary self-appraisal will always be insufficient, but was glaringly insufficient when I was new, is I'm delusional about my life. At any given moment, I don't see myself accurately. You know, I can see you accurately, and I can see your life, and I can see things about you, and I can be helpful to you, and you can do that for me, but I don't have clarity. I definitely, you know, alcoholism, Clancy always says, is a disease of perception. And we like to think that, that oh, that's when we're drinking, right? <laughs> no. Because at any given moment, I can be wrong about what I hear or what I think. I mean, I, I could just be sitting there minding my own business, just thinking, which is, you know, it's kind of a contact sport with me. And I remember a couple of years ago, I just had this one thought, and I called, my wife was in her office, and I called out to Eileen. I said, hey, sweetie. And she goes, yeah. I go, are you going to divorce me soon? And she said, well, I hadn't thought of it. I go, just checking, thanks. <laughs> a couple years back, I'm driving with a friend of mine. We come to this four-way intersection, and I, I slow down, and I turn to him, and I go, are we clear? And he goes, go ahead. So I punch it. We almost get T-boned and die. And as we clear the intersection, we both look at each other and start yelling. I go, what the hell, man? He said, go ahead. He goes, I said, we're dead. <laughs> I don't hear what people are saying a lot of the time. The book is really clear about seeking out a closed mouth friend. It says if you belong to a religious denomination, you should go ahead. I'm, I'm just really glad that I did my inventory, my first one and all my subsequent inventories with my sponsor. And the reason that that's important to me is because I don't look at the inventory process the way I did when I was new, I don't look at it that way today. You see, when I was new, the steps were very compartmentalized. You know, I'm step one, I'm on step two, I'm on step... What step are you on? Step six, sir, you know, I knew exactly where I was. And There's big walls between the steps, you know, you know what step you're on. But, you know, now when I go into inventory, I know that I'm going through a process. You know, I'm going through steps four through nine. And it's really important for me that I do that fifth step with someone that's going to be there for those other steps. Because I'm going to get foot sore, and I'm going to get nervous, and I'm going to get a little concerned when I have to go to 8 and 9. It really helps that that person knows exactly what that situation was about. So it's so helpful to me that I understand I'm going to be going on, and there's more work that's going to happen after I do steps 4 and 5. And I'm, I'm terrified to do steps in 4 and 5. And i got two things, two things on my list I'm going to take to my grave. And I haven't written them down. And I don't know that I'm going to tell my sponsor. I'm kind of waiting for the moment to see if it's going to happen. And I sit down with my sponsor, and we get on our knees, and we say the third step prayer again. And we get up, and he says, okay, start reading. So I'm on the first part of the three-part inventory process, resentments. My first resentment listed, my father. What's the cause? He left and never looked back. What does it affect? My whole damn life. What's my part in it? I left it blank. My sponsor looks at me, and he goes, you left the fourth column blank. I said, I know. He goes, we're not off to a good start. <laughs> We're in the first couple of minutes of my inventory, and I'm yelling at my sponsor. Are you kidding me? I was two years old. The guy left, and he never sent a dime. We grew up in poverty. I got my ass kicked every day because of that guy. I go on and on and on. I start crying. I'm furious with my sponsor, another guy that doesn't understand what was done to me. My sponsor takes it all in. He goes, let me ask you something. When did he leave? He said, you know that. When I was two years old. He goes, how old are you now? I go, I'm 31. He goes, let me get this straight. 
So you let a guy that you haven't seen in 29 years that you really don't even really know completely dominate your entire life. The clouds just opened up. I would not do your inventory alone. I would do it with your sponsor. <laughs> There's things that happen to every alcoholic in recovery, and that was mine. That was the linchpin. That was the catalyst for letting go of victimization. i got to tell you, I went through that whole inventory, and I cried through a lot of it. I cried through a lot of it because I was ashamed. I've been holding that stuff so close, so deep inside me, so embarrassed about what I had done to people and how I'd lived my life. And now I don't have any whiskey in me, so the justification and rationalization, it's just ripped apart, and it's all happening one after another, resentment after fear after fear, behavior in my intimate sexual relationship, over and over. I'm just wrung out, and it's going on for hour after hour. I just, I just don't think I can take anymore. And I, and I got those things, and he didn't ask me the questions. Is there anything you've left out? And I don't want to tell him. I don't want to tell him these things, you know? And I know and I believe what the book says. And I closed my eyes and I said a quick prayer. And I said, God, if you want me to do it, you've got to do it for me. And I opened my mouth and the words came out. And I told this man I call sponsor two things I was going to take to my grave. My two biggest secrets, the two things I did that I could never make right, the two things I'm the most embarrassed about. And I'd love to tell you that I felt the weight of the world lift off my shoulders. It cracked me wide open. And it was so important for a guy like me to be cracked open. It was the final straw in breaking down that ego of really understanding the monster that I had become and the way that I really lived. No explanation, no blaming it on the whiskey. That's really how I had lived. And I got up from that, and we held each other, and, you know, it was a very powerful experience. And then I waited for the gift. You know, the gift. You know, you go home, and you take about an hour. You review the first five proposals, and, uh, you, you know, have you tried to make mortar without sand? You ask those silly construction questions, and you go, No. I told them the bad stuff. I got it all down there on paper, and you feel good about it. And you wait for that crap you've been hearing about in Alcoholics Anonymous for all those months leading up to you doing your fifth step. Well, I finally feel like I've joined AA. I feel the nearness of God. I feel like God and I are skipping down the broad highway. And so I know that's going to happen to me because I am tortured. I still want to drink, right? I did my fifth step. I still want to drink every day. I mean, I'm the alcoholic described in the book. I didn't get placed in that position of neutrality until I was in the ninth step, working a tenth and eleventh step on a daily basis. So I'm growing inventory, did an inventory. I'm still thirsty. I'm not as thirsty as I arrived in Alcoholics Anonymous. So it's getting better, but it's still there. But I'm not happy. I can't sleep at night. I'm still. I call my sponsor up a couple of days later. I go, uh, fifth step, fourth step. He goes, Yeah. I go, I think we did it wrong. He goes, What? What, what makes you think we did it wrong? I go, I'm miserable, man. I feel worse now than before I did it. I've never felt so guilty and dirty and shameful, and I can't look anybody in the eye. And he goes, uh, Don, I was there. I heard your fist step. You should feel guilty and shameful and dirty. (laughs) He said, you haven't done anything yet. You haven't done anything yet. And I got to tell you, and this is other, another thing that happens in Alcoholics Anonymous, and it's so, we have to remember the lessons, and we have to remember what Bill's writing in the book. And one of Bill's big themes in the book, right, was self-knowledge avails us nothing. That for the real alcoholic, he will absolutely be unable to stop drinking on the basis of self-knowledge. And everybody agrees with that, that understanding how bad your alcoholism is, understanding that you're going to go to jail, understanding that she's going to leave, that she's going to come back, whatever, will not keep you from drinking. We understand that. But what do you think you have when you finish your fifth step? When you finish your fifth step, you have kryptonite. You have nitroglycerin. You have, for the first time in your alcoholic adult life, with no justification and no rationalization, probably the purest form of self-knowledge you've ever had. And the problem with it is it feels valuable. It feels important. Now I understand myself. Now I see the error of my ways. Now I know that these things could never happen again. And many of us, after we do our fifth step, we stall. And we don't go into six and seven with the inertia that we should. And we don't do eight and nine. And we don't make those amends and we get drunk again. And we can't figure out why. And we don't understand that we haven't completed the process. That this is just part of the process. It's the information that I need to have so I can go out and start to live a different kind of life and go clean up the damage that I've done in the past. But after I do my fifth step, hopefully I do feel crappy about what I've done. 
hopefully, once again, I've got another shot of the propellant. I've got another shot of desperation. I've entered into a relationship with my Creator. I'm praying every morning and every night. I'm seeking God's will in my thoughts and actions. I want to please my God. I don't want to treat His kids this way anymore. I've met the monster in the inventory process. I've shared it with God and another human being. I want to go clean this up. I want to continue with it because I don't want to hurt anybody anymore. I don't want anybody to spend another minute of their life carrying a burden that I created. I want to let them off the hook. And it makes me feel terrible. And that terrible feeling is really nothing more than desperation, which is the propellant that's going to take us through the rest of the steps when we're done with 4 and 5. And as much as I understand 4 and 5 on a personal level, i got to tell you, when I was... when I was, uh, I'll tell you this story, and I'm running out of time, but it, it's important that I talk about inventory and how it's gone on. Inventory has been my process for addressing my life. I do a yearly inventory, and sometimes more often than that, depending on what's going on. You know, uh, I love the workshop yesterday that Bob and Linda did, and I was looking at the timeline, and I'm thinking, yeah, I was 11 years sober, married seven years when we blew up our marriage. Just blew it up. Blew it up. It was over. We had to sit down, look at each other, and go, okay, uh, we can't do the last seven years over. So what are we going to do? Uh, we're either going to get divorced, and that'd be easy. Man, that'd have been easy. And it looked really good right then and there. Or we got to do this differently. We didn't know how. And we had to go into inventory, and we had to spend a lot of time with the sponsors, and we had to get outside help. And, I mean, I wrote a joggernaut of an inventory about my marriage and my wife. I mean, it it was unbelievable. And when I got done and I saw the patterns and shared it in the fifth step, I went, that can't be it. It's too simple. It can't be it. So I wrote another inventory right on top of it because I must have missed something. And I got the same answer in the second inventory. And what I found out, all the problems in my marriage were attributed to just one simple theme. I didn't think my wife deserved God in that marriage. I'd never turn my marriage over to God. It was that simple. She didn't deserve it. She didn't act the way I wanted her to act, so I wasn't going to treat her the way I thought God should have me treat her. You know how embarrassing that was at 11 years sober, speaking in AA, sponsoring a bunch of guys, going to a ton of meetings? And I've cut my wife off from my God. I'm so grateful for inventory because the only way I would have ever discovered that was by doing that and going on that journey. When I started writing my inventory shortly after that, I think God's got a sense of humor. I went on a 12-step call, and I went on a 12-step call with a guy with, you know, my leg to sobriety. I think I had four or five months, and this guy, uh, the other guy had four or five months, and that guy with 14 years went with us. And we went in this 12-step, and there was Donnie M., and Donnie N. was there, and he had a bottle of Jack Daniels in front of us, you know, daring us to take his bottle from him. He said, no, we don't, we don't do that. You want to drink, drink. You called us. <laughs> And we all took shots at Donnie, you know, and I gave Donnie my best, like, four or six month stuff, just hit him with everything, like, yeah. I don't know, I do what my sponsor tells me, somehow it seems to be working, I don't want to kill myself as often, you know. Real message of hope. And we leave, and Donnie's still drinking, and I think it didn't work, and I was a complete waste of time. And the next day I get off work, I get home, there's a message from this guy, Donnie, you know, because I left him my number at my sister's house. And so I call him up, and he goes, listen, where's that meeting tonight? And so I tell him, I tell him, where's that? are you thinking of coming? He goes, yeah, I think I'm going to come to that meeting tonight. I said, oh, do you need to pick you up? He goes, no, I got a car. And I thought, man, he's doing better than me. And, uh... and Donnie shows up at the meeting, man. So I welcome him. I get him half a cup of coffee. It's his first day of sobriety. I start talking to him. And he goes, you know, that stuff he said last night about sponsorship made, made sense to me. Would you be my sponsor? And I said, you know what, I'll get right back to you. And I run over to my sponsor and I go, hey, man, this guy asked me to sponsor him. You know, the guy in the 12-step call, blah, blah, blah. What would you tell him? Well, I told him I'd get right back to him. He goes, let me get this straight. This guy was drinking last night? I go, uh-huh. And somehow he found the strength to make it to a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous? Uh-huh. And he reached out to you for help? Uh-huh. And you said you'd get back to him? Uh-huh. And he said, go say yes, you selfish bastard. And, uh... <laughs> and I turned to my sponsor. I said, look, man, I don't want to kill him. I'm not even through the steps. He goes, ah, you got to kill a couple before you get the hang of it. <laughs> and I started sponsoring Donnie. And I took Donnie through the steps of Alcoholics Anonymous, and I got to sit there with Donnie, and I got to get on my knees and do a third step prayer. And I got to do the third step prayer on my knees with Donnie again right before we did his fourth and fifth step. And he shared his fourth step with me. 
And I got to sit across from a man and watch him well up in tears and cry about the shame and remorse and the terror that he felt for the things he had done and the way that he lived. And I got to take the things that I was so embarrassed about, the things I would never tell another human being, that I would never share with anybody, and I got to take those out of the vault. And the thing I was swore I'd never tell him, I got to share with Donnie. And I got to lessen his load a little bit. One alcoholic talking to another alcoholic to reduce his feelings of difference so he can start to take actions he does not yet believe in. And that's in Clancy Eye. And we do that in that inventory process, and we do that on a daily basis. And I was able to do it with Donnie, and Donnie was my mirror. You know, I watched myself in Donnie. I saw a clearer picture of myself than I had ever seen before when I was doing inventory by listening to a fist step of another man. And that was in my first year of sobriety, and I probably heard over a hundred fist steps. Easy, I don't know, I don't keep count. But I'll tell you what, every time I sit down with a man and he reads his fist step to me, it's a mirror to myself, and I see myself again. And I see where alcoholism takes people, and it takes me back. And I'm so encouraged and so excited for the new man who's sitting there, who's made it to that point in his recovery, that he's actually to the point where he's sharing his fifth step with his sponsor, because I know how close he is. I know how close he is to the prize. I know that if he keeps going and he starts making those amends and he gets into 10, 11, and 12, that everything's going to be all right, that he's so close to safety. And I'm so proud that he's made it that far, and I get to see myself in that process. I gotta tell you, I love this event, and I'll tell you what I love about this event. And it's not that it's, you know, it's, it's Stormtrooper AA, and we just talk about the steps, and it's sobriety done right. It's not that. That's not what I, that's not what I'm feeling this weekend, and that's not what I'm seeing. You know, I, I know who's here. I know who you are. You are the zealots. You are the really sick alcoholics. You're the ones that think it'd be fun to go to a four-day retreat and talk about the steps. And why is it that you think that's fun? Because I know something about a lot of the people in this room. I know they sponsor a lot of people. I know they're married. I know their fathers, their husbands, their wives, their children. They want to be better members of Alcoholics Anonymous. And we come together and we do this stuff so we can go back out to there to our respective little home groups and our little meetings where maybe we're fighting off a few resentments of our own. Or maybe we feel alone sometimes. Or maybe we get a little foot sore. I know I do. And we come here together with our friends, and we come here to get re-energized. And we come here to remember what we're, what's really going on. And what's really going on is this. Why, why, why we're in here this morning, safe, sane, and sober. They're right outside those doors, right outside those walls, and they're out there dying. But bet your bottom dollar, they're coming to Alcoholics Anonymous. They're coming. They're close. They're so close. This is December. I love December in Alcoholics Anonymous. This is right before an unofficial membership drive, you know, and just, I mean, January and AA, oh, the rank, the rooms just fill up with sickness. It's awesome. And uh, there's three people in my hometown, of, or my town of Bellingham, Washington, that I know personally, their sobriety date is January 1st. How the hell do you do that? How do you throw a dart at the calendar and, I mean, I had the same plan. I was going to get sober January 1st. My date is September 16th, you know. Just... <laughs> but they're coming to Alcoholics Anonymous, and they're coming for you. And they're really, really close, you know. It's like they're, they're going, I can't take it anymore. i got to do something about my drinking. My family's getting torn apart. And somebody goes, you should go to AA. What? And not ruin Christmas? <laughs> I have a streak. I have a streak to defend, you know. <laughs> But they're close. They're just finishing up their story, and they're going to come to AA. And, you know, when they get here, we got to be here for them. And I think that's what this weekend is about. So we're ready to take people through the steps. We're ready to give them the same recovery that was given to us. I think about the simplicity of the program of Alcoholics Anonymous, how it was spoon-fed to me, this combination of service, unity, and recovery, in the rooms, going to tons of meetings, cleaning up, setting up, sitting there reading a book with my sponsor, at night alone on my knees, seeking a God I didn't yet believe in, that fledgling, that beginning, that kindergarten spirituality, that flame being ignited, thinking that maybe this could happen to me, this excitement, this wonderful thing. And they're going to come here and they're going to get to experience that. And I think we come here to get re-energized so we know that when we come here, we're ready. They're going to be like my first sponsor, Mark, and his sponsor, Lou. They're going to be on the ready, standing in the room, waiting for the new man to come in. They're going to have a plan in action, and when they come, they're going to go get him. You're going to go get them and give them the first aid, the spiritual first aid that was given to me. That's my link in the chain. It's not coming up here and talking and hopefully you like my talk and I look good. and I'm, It doesn't matter. 
What matters is if I get off of here and I check my phone and I got messages from my sponsors, I return their calls. And when I go back in my home group that I'm there, that I'm available, that I'm willing to be inconvenienced. My first sponsor used to say, I'll say this and I'll sit down. He said, to the degree that I'm willing to be inconvenienced to my fellow alcoholic, that is the true degree that I walk with God. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.